characters in Warhammer 40k bring quite a lot to the table, but sometimes it's kind of interesting that their special rules they bring don't really help out their model or unit at all. Let's take a look at one interesting way to take a look at these multi-layered characters and what they could bring to the table. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought I'd do a character video for something that I've just been thinking about for a while recently, namely breaking away some character type rules and what the typical army might be tempted to pay for them on the board. I guess for the theme today I'd call this added value characters maybe. Several characters in Warhammer 40k 10th edition just have multiple layers of extra stuff they bring to the game. You obviously get the characters damage and defensive profiles, often with interesting boosted relic weapons and good armour and invulnerable saves, though I guess typically for characters they tend to have fairly low defence for the cost if say they were just fielded completely on their own. Otherwise though, they usually come with some sort of boost that they actually give to the squad themselves, say giving them sustained hits like Azrael here, or advanced shoot and charge like Marnius Kalgar. Though throughout the many armies of Warhammer 40k, there's plenty of characters out there that just bring some extra value to the army that aren't really tied to their unit at all, things like generating command points, ruining enemy stratagems, or redeploying things. I thought one fun way to think about the extra rules is considering how much that extra supporting rule is really worth to you if you could buy it just completely in isolation, as sometimes you can with enhancements. It just could be one idea for examining the value of a character in your army. Say for example, if you separated out how much Grandmaster Azrael's command point farming ability was worth to you, if you considered that lumped in as a big part of his value, then would the rest of the cost of his character be justified in terms of just his damage and defence, and the really quite good boost that he gives to his unit. Obviously most of the time you do need to think about the entire character value proposition, as opposed to just a few of these that you could buy in with enhancements, but if you're looking at, say, new characters added to the games or ones that have rules really quite drastically rewritten, it might be one interesting way to think about whether or not they're overall worth it. For this video, I thought it might just be interesting to focus on three really quite common added value rules, these ones in specific. First up, the command point generation one, generating one CP in each of your command phases, one that's really quite common throughout Warhammer 40k, say for example, Azrael, Imatek the Stormlord, Marnius Kalgar, Lord Solar Leontus and the Tyranid Swarm Lord, though unfortunately not every faction has equal access. Otherwise, another very common one is to kind of ruin an enemy battle tactic stratagem. After they've used it once, it gets one CP more expensive for the rest of the game, and that can be good on multiple things. And again, that's present on loads of stuff. The Kaladus Assassin, the Swarm Lord, the Archon, or the Astra Militarum Kuros Aquila. Finally, another external added value one is the ability to redeploy three units after both players have set up, with the option to put them in strategic reserve. Again, Lord Solar Leontus has that for the Astra Militarum, the Katarn Shard of the Deceiver for the Necrons, and some enhancements do it like Tyranid's Alien Cunning. Perhaps more for interest than anything else, I thought it would be fun to ask you guys what it would be worth to you to buy in each of those rules, via a big channel poll asking how much you would pay for these if you could buy them as an upgrade for a character to gain that special rule. I say this is at least a little bit scientific, but obviously it comes with all sorts of different caveats. I'm sure a bunch of people will point these out in the comments even if I do run through them here. Some of these rules might have vastly different value depending on the army that you're playing with, whether or not you really need every command point that you can get to use powerful stratagems with, or whether or not you have really powerful meaningful units to redeploy. And sometimes the exact bearer of the upgrade might matter quite a bit, whether or not it's something that can sit safe for the entire game and rustle you up CP, for example. I'd also say that while there is a bit of wisdom of crowds going on if you ask everyone, often what you just get from a community vote isn't actually going to be the answer you'd get from, say, a top competitive player, perhaps. So it's more of a measure of perceived value of the community, as opposed to 100% proven accurate or anything. Still, though, I was interested to see what you guys would rate these rules in terms of points costs, and feel free to think of some values in your own head for what you'd pay for each of these rules now before we go on if you'd like. Starting out to take a look at these, we'll go for the command point generation one. This one gets you one command point in each of your command phases. Really quite powerful given CP can be traded for enormous swings in game. They might have more or less value for them depending on how good your stratagems are within your chosen detachment. There's definitely some detachments out there where the stratagems are absolutely the driving force of power, and some of them where they're kind of just extra nice to have. This rule doesn't stack with other sources of generating CP abilities, so say if you had options to get them refunded by one way or another, it might make those redundant, and you also wouldn't get the extra CP for dropping their tactical objective halfway through the game, which might mean that occasionally you're doubling up on the rule, and you wouldn't really be getting extra value on that turn. 
In theory land, at least though, 5 extra CP is really massively powerful, though it could be a bit less if you do have that overlap as mentioned, or if the character dies sometime throughout the game, so it's going to be better on things that sit back and stay in the game till very late. And I guess there's a bit less value in having an extra CP right on the last turn, as opposed to earlier in the game when you might genuinely make game-changing swings. Finally, I would say that there's a bit of diminishing return with these. If you, say, had 10 CP to spend over the game, you'd expend them on the 10 most valuable stratagems, or try to. If you had 15 CP to spend over the course of the game, those extra 5 would go on lesser value stratagems, or they should do at least, but that's not to say that they still don't have huge value. Between all this, you guys seem to have ranked the rule at 35 points, and for a slight spoiler, that was the highest out of these three value-added rules, which I would agree with, though personally I think I might have ranked this one even higher in terms of points cost, maybe genuinely in the 40 to 50 points sort of range, if you could just buy this in on a safe character that could sit around all game. I guess it genuinely does depend on the army that you've got though, some faction stratagems just aren't really all that. Though I would argue that even the value of CP rerolls on some big swings like big saves or failed wound rolls for enormous damage weapons might genuinely be enough to pay for the entire value of this in just one roll, or triggering other powerful damage dealers like Tank Shock, never mind more subtle stuff that could actually produce bigger swings in game. In theory land though, if we are going for this internet poll voted value of the one command point upgrade, it means that you could potentially just apply that to some of the characters out there. Say for example, Grandmaster Azrael costs 105 points. If you assume that 35 points worth of that value is coming from generating CP, it'd overall be a 70 point character. For his very respectable melee captain stat line for the power sword, plus the ability to grant an invulnerable save and sustained hits to his unit, Overall, just pretty massive value all around, and maybe not too surprising to see why he's a staple in Dark Angels list at that. I'd argue the same is true for Marnius Kalgar, 150 points if you remove that CP rule from consideration, and for that you get his massive melee profile, the very tanky and surprisingly dangerous Bladeguard equivalents, and advanced shoot and charge for his unit of aggressors or Bladeguard or whatever else he joins. Overall, just massive value for what you get, and not surprising to see him cropping up in so many Ultramarines lists. Next up, for the Ruiner Stratagem type rule, this is the one to make a single enemy battle tactic stratagem cost 1 CP more. For subsequent uses after the first time they've used it, it could be used to ruin a staple stratagem such as Armour of Contempt for Space Marines, which will be pretty nasty to put that up to 2 CP given that it's quite a staple, though I certainly wouldn't underestimate its use on the Humble Command Point reroll. Say if your opponent failed a short charge later in the game and weren't able to reroll due to this, you could have just netted yourself a hilarious in-game swing. It also does increase battle tactic stratagems even after they're made free with a captain. You apply the addition after the zero modifier. So it could be quite nice if you're fighting enemies with captains or their equivalents making battle tactics free. Compared with the command point generation, I'd say that the actual character who bears it probably matters a bit less. You're probably going to want to trigger it early in the game if it actually matters this game. So in theory, most of your characters should survive at least until that point, And you don't have to be hoping that they're sitting safe for the later turns. For this one, on average you chose to rate this at 30 points, which seems about right to me. And unlike the command point generation one, there is actually a bit more precedent for this one being able to be bought in individually for certain armies. Say for example the Astra Militarum can take Cure of Aquila, which I'd say is really quite rarely played in competitive lists at the 40 points that it costs. Whereas you can get exactly the same thing in the Space Marine Vanguard Spearhead formation with the Shadow War Veteran trait, which certainly isn't played in every list maybe implying that it's somewhat fairly costed at that 30 point thing, though it does maybe kind of depend on a bit of a gamble as to whether or not you think your opponent's going to have battle tactics that are seriously worth ruining. Another common example in 40k armies at the moment at least is the Calidus Assassin, who often seems to justify her presence with this making up quite a good chunk of her value, never mind her lone operative jumping round the board and anything she does with her actual weapons. Again, just going into theoretical land here with the ability to ruin stratagems, the Calidus will be 90 points normally, and if you gave this option a 30 point value in your head, then in theory she's a 60 point character after that's been used, feeling genuinely really quite a cheap investment to go bouncing around the board trying to get secondary objectives, and potentially even trying to actually assassinate an enemy character if she has a valid target. Otherwise, there's a good few units like the Stormlord that get multiple of these benefits, the Swarm Lord both gets the command point generation and the Ruiner Stratagem type of ability. If we went with the internet voted points for both of those, that would be 65 points of value, meaning that you're paying around about 205 points just for his raw damage and defence. Again, that one feels like it pretty much checks out for me. 
The Swarm Lord really doesn't see competitive play in the vast majority of army lists right now. I think that 205 points would be too much to really justify just his damage and defensive profiles completely in isolation. For 200 points, he's really not all that hard to take down, despite the 4 plus invulnerable save, even if his damage I think is alright given the twin linked on the bone sabers. He also might well not be the optimal bearer for the generate 1 command point option, given that you'll be getting no value out of a really quite expensive damage and defense profile unless you actually have him moving towards the enemy, and that's likely going to put him on the front lines and at risk of being killed. Finally, for that trio of special rules, there's the redeploy 3 units one. This is the one that after both players have set up, you get to redeploy 3 of your units, potentially anything that was out of position and just about to get alpha struck by the enemy, and you can put them into strategic reserve if it makes sense, which could be one way to bypass the limits of units that you're normally allowed to do so with that. I think that this one probably could do with an FAQ as I have seen some online debate as to whether or not it happens before or after first turn. I would argue before myself, and from what I understand that's often the case for tournaments. Say for example the recent Las Vegas Open FAQ seemed to agree with that interpretation, only allowing it to happen after first turn is known if you've got a specific thing that says it's like the Phobos captain for the Space Marines. It could probably also do with clarifying its interaction with infiltrators, though in general the thinking seems to be that if you redeploy infiltrators like this, they can't use infiltrates to set up again. All that potential rules debate aside that Games Workshop might fix in the not too distant future, the first term redeployment type things is definitely powerful. You might be able to tweak some units that your opponent might be able to move to destroy turn 1 if they get first turn, or perhaps do some sort of big grand strategy type thing and refuse a flank, moving all your resources over to one objective when they were previously on another, or even just try and flat out confuse the opponent's deployment and battle plans a bit by having things that you basically earmarked for strategic reserve, setting them up on the board and then putting them into reserve after your opponent tries to counter deploy them. Again though I'd say that this is probably one that sometimes it matters big and sometimes it doesn't. If your opponent's got a fairly stock deployment and they're just going to hide all their units and play very cagey with you, it might have a little bit less value. As for your vote rating it though, to buy this in individually you guys chose to rank it 31 points overall, though as with the others there was really quite a big variance on how much different armies would pay for it. This one's kind of interesting as it almost absolutely doesn't matter what character it's on given that it happens before the game begins. Though it does vary quite a bit depending on what actual army that you're playing with, given that if you've got really big elite units in your army then you could redeploy meaningful things, but if you're playing with lots of multiple small units chaff, the units that you might be able to redeploy aren't that big a deal. Or say for example if you're playing a horde style army where your opponent's almost certainly going to be able to shoot something important still. Again though I feel like this kind of points value seems to be kind of on the money for this one. One example where you can buy this in individually is the Tyranids Invasion Fleet's Alien Cunning Enhancement for 30 points. That one does look like it's one that does see some competitive play, so people consider it viable, though it isn't in absolutely every list, maybe implying that it is kind of fairly costed at that kind of points level. Again, applying the discounts to a couple of named characters that come with it, if you did indeed choose to value this as, say, 31 points worth of value, that's to make the rest of the Catan Shard of the Deceiver theoretically 234 points, and without that special rule, if you did think it was powerful enough to use that way, that would very theoretically make him into the cheapest Catan rather than a sort of mid-price one. He still might struggle to outcompete with the special abilities of the others though, which definitely have their own huge value. Otherwise, I couldn't help but try and apply these to Lord Solar for the Imperial Guard as well. He gets the command point generation thing and also the redeploy. So in theory that would be 35 points plus 31 points, and given that he's only a 125 point character that would drop him down to 59 in total, and that is just kind of hilariously massively valuable for the rest of the stuff that he brings, he's got an okay sort of Space Marine Captain style stat line in combat, but far more importantly is basically the God of Orders, being able to throw out three of them to nearby units, maybe further if he's paired with a command squad, and those orders can go on some seriously funky stuff like, say, Auxilia and Super Heavies, as well as Tank Commanders and things. I guess whichever way you choose to look at Lord Solar's value, it's not really surprising he's basically in just about every Imperial Guard competitive list. Even if overall you do want to pay a bit more for him to give him some bodyguards to perhaps sit on the home objective with him, and maybe a command squad to broadcast those orders. But if he could be somewhat guaranteed to hide him out of line of sight for several turns, he could probably justify himself even if you somehow couldn't choose to attach him to a squad. In any case, let me know what you think of those abilities, and would you indeed rate them at those sort of internet voted points cost within your army, or would you rate them more or less for your particular force? 
I think it could be a pretty interesting option for evaluating characters in Warhammer 40k anyway, and you could certainly try and apply it to other characters out there with less common boosts. Say for example Uriel Ventress I think is another very good example of this. He gives one other unit deep strike, which depending on the unit and detachment you could certainly value at a whole ton of points. Is often seen with it in Vanguard Spearhead with Centurions. And for me personally, I think you could easily value that as, say, an enhancement for 30 points or something like that, meaning that actually for the rest of his Captain Combat profile, he could be really quite cheap indeed, and therefore makes him kind of viable just to throw into a unit of Assault Intercessors or Company Heroes or something as a cheap and effective melee skirmisher. Otherwise, the Tower Ethereal could be interesting enough for a command point generation point of view. He generates a CP on a 4 plus each turn, which I guess you might think of as half of the original CP generation thing maybe somewhere around the 20 points sort of mark perhaps, and then for his feel no pain and actual stat line, that could be seen as 30 points beyond that maybe. Otherwise, could be fun to try and consider certain characters' buffs in isolation. If Iron Father Fyros could put himself in a situation where he's both using his feel no pain to buff one unit, and also helping out vehicles with a plus one to hit and the big three wounds heal per turn, it certainly feels like it could be enough value to be worth building around him, even if it does mean taking some specific things. I guess for him though it might be more the case that he's competing against very cheap tech marines for a similar sort of role though I guess. In any case look forward to hearing some thoughts on any of your own characters with these boosted abilities out there in the game. Which ones do you rate well or not? And would it help to think of having extra value and then the rest of the characters stats being just a bit cheaper? as one way to separate things out in your mind. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep all of these coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.